Ah, all right. Tough loss. Feels like we've been saying that a lot lately. Uh, for the Knicks in Miami, 109 to 99. Um, this is tough. This is tough right now. Um, this season, as many have commented to me on um, recently, like it's been as much of a roller coaster as anything that I think a lot of us can remember. Um, it's, you know, it's been weird because I don't know that it's necessarily been ups and downs. It was just kind of very uneasy going for a while. And then there was such a high in January. And then the last two plus months have been a mix of uncertainty have been a mix of worrying about whether they could keep their head above water. But more than anything, I think the last two months have uh, imbued a sense of pride in this team because of how hard they fight amidst um, really challenging circumstances. And it tonight was no exception, unsurprisingly. Uh, down 15 at the half, down 16 at one point in the game in the in the second half. Uh, I think they were down. I think they went down by 12. Uh, yeah, they did go down. No, actually, I think they went down by by 13 early in the fourth quarter. Um, <clears throat> and they just keep fighting back. Tied this one up with uh what was it like three or so minutes to go and yet i think the overarching sentiment because again we've been so proud the reason we've been so proud of them is because we recognize i think as fans how much that what they are doing is really i mean you talk about ice skating uphill and it's been two plus months of that and they have had opportunities to let go of the rope and they never have. And, and that's why I thought it was interesting. You know, what, what Breen said a few times tonight, you know, Clyde kind of alluded to it too. It was really Breen that brought it up that, and I think I wrote down exactly what he said at one point, New York's playing like the two losses took a little bit out of them. And I think it was obviously referring to the San Antonio loss and the Oklahoma city loss. And I think it was, yes, obviously. You lose two straight games like that, it takes a lot out of you. But I, to me, watching this game tonight, it was almost as if I was watching a team that, like, the last two months of holding on to that rope for dear life kind of took something out of them. And I think you saw that manifest itself in the first half, for sure, when they were, and really, mostly just the first quarter. Because if you look at the rest of the game, <clears throat> if you look at the rest of the game, they were the Heat outscored them by three in the second. The Knicks outscored the Heat by five in the third, and they were even in the fourth. It was really just the fourth, it was, or the first quarter. It was how they came out. They were down by 12 after the first quarter. They lost the game by 10, you know? And that was enough. It's just they didn't, uh, different than how they came out against the Spurs. I think they didn't quite have the extra gear tonight. It was just something else. It was like they lacked that spark. They lacked that verb. They lacked that something else that we've seen them have now, again, for the better part of two months. Jalen Brunson, after having to shoulder an utterly gargantuan usage load to the point that he was just named Eastern Conference Player of the Month today, finally has a game where it's like, oh, man, that was that was not great. And I really... I really hope everybody is responsible and mature enough not to uh, throw arrows at Brunson's way because God fucking knows this team would be nowhere without him. Um, you know, he had a rough game. Uh, it it happens. And, you know, you're allowed. Everybody's allowed. doesn't matter if you're a top five MVP candidate or not. You're allowed to have a bad game. And he had a bad game. And he picked a night to have a bad game. When um, it wasn't Jimmy Butler on the other side of the floor, but Terry Rozier decided to play like uh, he was in the MVP race with 34 points on it and 15 shots. And like, that's the other part of me. Why I was like, you know, I was thinking, do I want to kind of go on a, a little soliloquy about how this team is really maybe they're, they're it's they're finally showing signs of a little bit of a mental wear and tear. Maybe Brunson is finally showing signs of a little bit of a mental wear and tear. 
Um, maybe, but then the other part of me is like, you know, um, Newsday reported before the game that, or during the game, actually, that Brunson, you know, mentioned he had a little bit of a cold. Right. And, of course, he was asked about it and said, hey, I'll be fine. I'm good enough to play. He's never going to use that as an excuse, and he won't use it as an excuse. But, like, maybe it was just Brunson had a cold and was under the weather. And maybe this was a matter of, like, a guy on the other side of the floor had 34 points on 15 shots and went 8 of 11 from deep. And because he went 8 of 11 from deep, they shot 44.7% from three, and the Knicks shot 35.3% from three. Like, sometimes it's really that simple. And maybe it is that simple. And maybe this isn't a game that we need to make. Or, or you know, again, we're not making too much of the game. That's kind of what I want to avoid tonight. But just, like, making more of where the Knicks are at at this point in the season than needs to be made. Um, I was looking back at last year, and last year's team didn't, didn't go up against anywhere near the amount of adversity that this year's team has gone up against. And yet with 10 games left in the season last year, this team lost three games in a row and it gave them six losses in seven games. Now from that point forward, they won, I think it was like four or five straight. And then, you know, they obviously wrapped up the, the five seed and, and onwards and upwards it was, but like, the fact that this team has now lost three games in a row, like it is not the end of the world. The sky is not falling. Whether it's whether it's because they were feeling the effects of what they've had to shoulder for two plus months, or whether it was just because, you know, um it was just one of those nights, like this team is still in a good position. Now, what's a good position? Your mileage may vary. Um, everybody was getting hopped up about the two seed a week ago, and now it's like, holy shit, are we sure we're gonna stay out of the play in? Like that's that's what three straight losses in the Eastern Conference can can do. Um, so I you know, I don't want to minimize the potential impact of a late season swoon. Like they still need to win games here. I don't know if it's gonna take three wins to stay out of the play in or the six seed. I don't know if it's going to take four wins. Could it possibly take five wins? Whatever it is, nothing about tonight, nothing about the Thunder game and nothing about the Spurs game. Make me think that this team will not find a way to get the wins, the requisite wins necessary to, to secure a playoff berth. And if I had to bet on it, I, a top five playoff berth. And if you do that, like you're still okay. It's something that any of us would have signed for if you would have told us on January 27th, you're not going to see Julius Randle again until probably, or if you, you may not see Julius Randle again, but you're not going to see him again until at least sometime after April 2nd. And you're going to see OG Ananobi for three games, you know, in that time, we, we would have all signed for that. And I think if we're being reasonable, we should all still sign for that now, but it doesn't change the fact that, you know, we're feeling it. And it was another game that they could have possibly had, and they didn't get it. And it sucks, and it hurts, and it's annoying, and it's annoying to lose to that team. It's always annoying to lose to that team um, because this is not a great Heat team. Terry Rozier had a great night. They do a lot of good things. They frustrate the hell out of you, but this is not a great Heat team. And so I think that probably makes it even a little bit extra frustrating. Um, of course, as there is with every Nick game, um, win or lose a lot of positives. And I actually, I wonder, I wonder if we may, may look back on this game as <clears throat> not a turning point. It's a little bit too strong, but like, I wonder if we may look back on the positives that come out of, or that came out of this game as overshadowing the negative of the loss. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is I think the Knicks may have found something with the bench. So unlike the previous two games where Jalen Brunson in a game they lost by, I forget if it was two or three points, he was a plus 20. And in a game they lost by one point, he was a plus 17. Tonight in a game they lost by 10 points, Jalen Brunson was a minus nine. And he played um, 36 minutes, which means in the 12 minutes that he did not play, the Knicks were about even. You know, they got scored by I got outscored by a point 
And what was that attributed to? Perhaps not coincidentally, of those 12 minutes that Jalen Brunson did not play, Alec Burks also did not play any of those 12 minutes. He still, Alec Burks finished tonight with uh, what was a season low with the Knicks at least, three minutes. Actually, what am I saying with the Knicks? Season low, period, because I guarantee he didn't play three minutes um, in any game with the Pistons. Might be the low mark of his career for all I know, but only played three minutes, and those three minutes came with Brunson. He actually checked in at the same time as Brunson in the first half. Um, just to give, I forget who he gave a breather, probably to give McBride a breather because McBride, I'm looking up, he played 45 minutes. So <clears throat> clearly the backup point guard Burks experiment is over in its place was a kind of a Frankenstein's monster of Dante DiVincenzo, Miles McBride, Josh Hart, and Boyan Bogdanovich kind of taking turns running the second unit show and it kind of worked and it kind of worked or at least worked better than anything we've seen recently. It gives you some shooting. It gives you some defense. It gives you some creativity. It gives you a little bit of everything. So, and in particular, I think what worked, what looked better than it has. And again, not, co not coincidental that all but three minutes of his tonight did not come with Alec Burks. Boy and Bogdanovich seemed to wake up. Uh, and even plus minus in, in 19 minutes, you like to see that 16 points on 10 shots. You really like to see that. I uh, thought he held his own on the defensive end of the floor. Not many times we could say that over the course of the time he's been with the Knicks. So if this is a game where we get out of this, hey, maybe the Knicks will not turn into a complete and total dumpster fire in the minutes to Jalen Brunson, because Jalen Brunson is not going to have many, if any, five for 18 games again. We need to, he'll be better. If the bench could could stay at this level of productivity and Brunson gets back to doing what Brunson's been doing all year, well, then we're in business. And so I think that's a potentially really big um, ram, know, call it ramification, but like something that we could take that's a positive from this game. We'll see if it keeps up. A couple other big takeaways from this game, and I'm, I'm going to go in order of what I find to be uh, least interesting to most interesting. Um, first up, Dante DiVincenzo. Uh, the reason I say that that is the least interesting is because Dante DiVincenzo was an awesome all year, and there is quite little about Dante DiVincenzo scoring 31 points, including uh, on 21 shots, only went 6 of 15 from deep, which like doesn't sound great. And at the end of the day, the percentage is like, it's still, it's not bad. You know, it's, it's, it's not, or it's not, it's fine. It's, you know, it's a 40% night from deep. Um, It doesn't look great. Like when you look at it, but it's 40% night from deep. Uh, and he needed to take those shots. If he makes a few more, you know, maybe we're talking about a different game. But I thought DiVincenzo uh, really stepped it up on a night that Brunson didn't have it. But again, that's not surprising because DiVincenzo has been awesome all year. But it was nice to see him, you know, again, have a big game when his co when his, his star didn't have what it took. Um, moving up the ladder of interesting pressure to Chua. So here are the minutes distribution tonight here at center for the Knicks. Isaiah Hardenstein, 18 minutes. Mitchell Robinson. 10 minutes and then pressure to chew played 27 minutes total, but seven of those are, was it was as a backup power forward 20 minutes, whereas the backup center. So more minutes at the center position than Isaiah Hardenstein or Mitchell Robinson. I thought that was uh, essentially a, an admission. Well, it was an admission of a couple of things um, connected things from Tibbs. One, um, we need a center who is going to be able to switch because we're just, we're most comfortable switching against this team and I think and he he thought I think clearly tonight at least that the best path to success against this heat um team at least when the Knicks were on defense was through switching and he felt that Achua could hold his own in terms of you know keeping him honest on the offensive glass and by the way I don't think that was necessarily a bad call pressure Achua six rebounds tonight to Isaiah Hartenstein's one and Mitchell Robinson's one one of those rebounds of course was the putback that um tied the game at 92 which was really awesome. Did Precious get gotten by Terry Rozier on the one most important switch he had? Absolutely. Can't foul on that spot. He knows it. Everybody knows it. It was a rough play from him. But all in all, I liked the belief that Tibbs showed in Precious. Um, and the other admission is is that, uh, and again, this is kind of the, the related part, and it's maybe as obvious, that he thinks Precious is their best switch guy at the five. Is that something that may... Uh, we may see more of moving forward, depending on who the opponent is. Absolutely. I 
it'll be it's something to monitor. Let's just say that. Something to monitor. So that was my second most interesting thing. And my most interesting thing, actually, you know, I forgot one. And I don't know, this goes somewhere at two or three or whatever. Um, Josh Hart and a I think a heat uh content creator commented on this. Played 46 minutes, took three shots. That hurt the Knicks. And you know, looking to pass instead of looking to shoot. You can make the argument that he bypassed a lot of makeable shots to, to pass. Um, if I was a betting man, and again, I don't see the super chats or any of the comments before I, I start taking them from from people. I would guess that he will be the um, punching bag tonight because he, people seem to love making Josh Hart the punching bag. It's um, it's funny the guys that we we as a fan base choose to do that too. Um, I'll just like there, it, it's one thing to bypass threes. It's another thing to completely bypass shooting altogether. I wonder if that's if something was up with him tonight, if something was bothering him. I saw there was a, uh, a comment from someone in the KFS Substack who I, I think is was obviously was in the game in Miami that said he saw Josh Hart come out for shoot around and like he took two shots and he was holding his elbow and then went to sit down. I don't know if there's something there. I'm. Happy to write it off as a as a one off for Josh Hart. Um, you know we have short memories here, but this team, for as much as they would be nowhere without Jalen Brunson, they would be nowhere without Josh Hart. Um, and again, that like the dude played forty six minutes tonight, and they needed him to play those forty six minutes because, like, defensively, he is their best option against the C team. And I say that in full acknowledgement that Deuce McBride is also out there. But Josh Hart, like that, sometimes that extra size doesn't matter as much depending on who the most threatening offensive players are for the opposing team against this Heat team that could throw Jimmy Butler at you, that could throw obviously Terry Rogier at you. Um, I think the extra size makes a big difference. And I, I also don't think it was a coincidence that Jimmy Butler had himself a five for 12 uh, night and finished without really making a big impact. I think that's a testament to Josh Hart's defense. I know he didn't guard him for every possession, but he was on him a lot. And um, but Josh Hart needs to shoot it and Josh Hart knows he needs to shoot it. And um, I'm sure that will not be a, a lingering problem moving forward. Um, and then the most interesting thing for me, and I'm going to end on a high note, and that's Deuce McBride. Uh, I mean, just go back and search my Twitter history about any number of things. I've had um, more shitty, incorrect, um, asinine. I mean what any other negative word you want to use takes theories, thoughts, predictions about this team and its players um, than anyone. Cause I've made a lot of them and many of them are wrong. Uh, and I'm happy to sit here and admit that. And the thing that I'm of all of those very, very bad takes, the one that I'm happiest to admit to admit is that I never thought that Deuce of pride was going to turn into anything more than a spunky, Eighth, ninth man, you know, on the on the right team, maybe he's an eighth, ninth man. Come in, give the uh, give the opposing team hell for five or six minutes. Um, if you're lucky, maybe he makes an open three. Because <clears throat> that's, I just I didn't didn't see it on offense. I looked at the numbers, I looked at the efficiency through two years. Said, yeah, I know, not a big sample size, but it's. It's enough for me. Guys don't turn into shooters overnight. Not when they've shown this much over the over the course of two years. Not to say guys can't improve, but I just I wasn't buying it. For the guy that we witnessed on offense over the first two years of his career to turn into the guy who was, I mean, I know DiVincenzo had 31 points on 21 shots, McBride 24 points on 16 shots. Um, you know, we're, we're arguing over semantics. He was, every, let's just say every bit as good as DiVincenzo tonight in, as, as an offensive player and not just as, oh, McBride's hitting open catch and shoot threes. He is graduating from that. He is doing different things. He's constantly moving. He's making himself into an offensive weapon. Is it in the way that you might traditionally see from a player of that size? Maybe not. But we're getting closer to that point. And he's just, he's made himself into an asset. 
Like, there's no like the Knicks are shorthanded and the Knicks are are fighting and scrapping and clawing and they're feeling it and they're feeling the loss of these guys that they don't have. And it is it is making their life more difficult. All of these things are true. But I don't think for a second that the presence of Deuce McBride is hurting them. I think Deuce McBride is helping them. He's helping them as a starter. He's helping them as a guy who is playing essentially every minute of the basketball game. Um, <clears throat> it's wild. And I again, didn't see it coming. Dead wrong. Couldn't have been more wrong. I was laughing at people that were like, yeah, I'm on Deuce Island, man. Shout out to you, uh, Alex. Uh, yeah. Uh, so awesome for him. And it's great for the Knicks because like, yeah, and I'm, you know, the injured guys, they're going to come up because, what you know, of course they're going to come up. But I, I he's earned the right to continue to play big minutes for the rest of the season. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing for um, for the Knicks. So going to end on a high note, even though I know this is going to be a down post game. And um, yeah, and that's it. So on that note, <clears throat> let's move on to our segments. I think. I think oh, yeah, here we go. The Unified Healing Road to Recovery. So you can go to Unified Healing. That is U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com to learn more and find a center near, near you. Once again, um, that is Unified Healing.com. That is Unified with a Y, F-Y-D, healing.com to find a center near you. Um, before I read the Unified Healing Road to Recovery, I'm just going to say a quick tweet. Uh, as per Stefan Bondi, um, Tom Thibodeau repeats five times, maybe six. I lost count about Jalen Brunson. He's getting fouled. 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 Interesting because I didn't think they had quite as much of an argument tonight. I did think the ref, the, the whistle was shitty in spots. For sure, the whistle was shitty in spots. I, I'm kind of beaten down at this point. Maybe that's what the refs want is to kind of just beat us down and make us numb to it. Um, clearly, Tom Thibodeau was not over it, though. Be curious if the uh, if the league has anything to say about that. Okay, the Unified Healing Road to Recovery. We got some extensive commentary before the game on, excuse me, on uh, Julius Randall, um, which was I'm going to pull it up here because I'm fairly certain I retweeted it. Yeah, this is uh, again courtesy of Steph Bondi. I'm just going to read this. the The thing for Julius is that he's got to keep working every day until he gets to the point where he feels confident that he could take the contact he's accustomed to. I'm going to get back to that in a second. When you look at the game, the way he plays, you don't want to change the style of play. That's important. So keep doing what you're doing. We have to have the belief that it'll turn, which I do. Maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe it's the day after. Who knows when it is. The thing that I find interesting about that, and maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm missing something, and one of the many people watching this, feel free to let me know if I'm missing something obvious. But I'm not sure what how... So he's working every day, doing whatever he's doing, but he's not taking contact. Tibbs is saying the thing that needs to happen is he needs to be able to sustain his usual dose of physicality. And he's saying he needs to work every day till he gets to the point where he feels confident that he could take that contact. Well, He's not taking contact right now. So I'm confused as to how he could get to the point where he is comfortable doing a thing which he's not currently doing. Like, I don't like I, I don't know how I'm supposed to. My, my daughter's trying to learn how to ride a two wheeler. I'm not sure how she's supposed to get comfortable learning how to ride two wheeler two wheeler if she never gets on the two wheeler. You know, is it like a is it completely mental? I I'm not sure especially when we have reporting from Fred Katz, which says that Julius Randle's dying to get back on the court. Um, so to me, this is either Tibbs kind of not tripping over his words, but like, you know, saying something that doesn't maybe make logical sense that a B they're just continuing to bullshit us. And they've just decided ahead of time, like, Julius is just going to play the last game of the season, the last two games of the season, and then we're going to take our chances. Or C, I'm missing something, which God knows won't be, wouldn't be the first time I'm missing something. So, 
Um, and then as far as OG, no, no new news other than what we said on the pod today, which is what Woj and Shams reported, which is that they expect him back before Julius. And, um, you know, they don't want to deal with a, a re-injury situation. So um, that is uh, the Unified Healing Road to Recovery, um, again, presented by our friends at he- Unified Healing. And on that note, we will go to the out-of-town scoreboard presented by our good friends at T-Squared Social. Join one of their Friday night leagues, whether it's darts, bowling, golf, or cornhole. Use promo code KFS10 for 10% off when you sign up for any of those leagues. Uh, The deadline to do that, I believe, is uh, tomorrow or today, if you're listening to this on the pod. Uh, Go to www.tsquaredsocial.com slash leagues to sign up. Hi, Andrew. Hi, John. How are you? Been better. I hate losing this team. It's annoying. The the bad part of the fan base has found my Bam out of bio tweets, and I, I'm in a war right now. I'll let you know how it goes, but apparently I'm 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 battling with some Twitter fingers at the moment. So oh, give me an Christ. update later. Good luck with all that. Um, okay. Uh, out of town scores. Uh, first and foremost, great to see R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel quickly back on the court and playing basketball for the Toronto Raptors after what those guys have been through. They both had very nice games. R.J. had 28, quickly had 20, um, but the Raptors stink, and they played the Lakers tonight, who are still playing for something. So Lakers win 128-111. to 111. Um, The Wizards beat the Bucs. Man, I don't know what's going to happen with the Bucs in the playoffs this year, but I am fascinated to see. Um, the Thunder in uh, Joel Embiid's return game for the Sixers lost to Philly. They were up for the entirety of that game, and then without Shea Gilders Alexander and without uh, Jalen Williams, could not pull it out late, missed some threes late. Sixers did just enough to win 109-105. Um, and then the only other game that's gone final is the Rockets have handed the, or excuse me, the Wolves have handed the Rockets their second straight loss, 113-106. And then as far as games going on right now that are relevant to the Knicks, there's only one, and that is Cavaliers-Jazz. Cavs up um, only by 11 on the Jazz in Utah. Seven minutes and change to go in the third quarter. Um, we'll see We'll see how that ga- game goes. Um, but I, the more important part, um, after the loss tonight, the Knicks are now in a tie with the Orlando Magic for fourth place in the East, which means they are in fifth place because they lose the tiebreaker. They're game back for the moment of Cleveland, and they are a game and a half up on Indiana. Who I be, I've, Does Indiana have their game with – they have a big game coming up. Um, they play Brooklyn tomorrow. Oh, the that's big right. one, The big that one is, is Miami on Sunday. Yeah. Okay, that's right. So they're in Brooklyn tomorrow night. I would expect that to be a win. I would expect them to pull within a game of the Knicks, and they have the tiebreaker – against the Knicks. So that is obviously something worth monitoring. And then the Heat pull within two of the Knicks. The Sixers, I'm not sure if this this update yet. Are the Sixers still three and a half back of the Knicks? Did they win tonight? They came back and won tonight? Yeah, yeah they, they did. came the back and won. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I don't I think the standings have updated. Um but anyway, I'm not I'm not worried about the Sixers catching it's, us. I do think that the Sixers are trying to make life interesting for themselves to try to get into the sixth spot. Um as far as the doomsday scenario of the Knicks falling into the play-in. Look, Miami's two games back, but the Knicks have the tiebreaker. Um, the Knicks have seven games left. The Heat also have seven games left. I'm, I'm like one percent paying attention now. I will not go so far as to say that I am worried yet. Um, it would take, it would. I mean, it would take a complete and total collapse from a Nick team that still does have three games against the Bulls and one game against the next, the Nets, and a game tomorrow against the King or two games, sorry, two days from now against the Kings. That I, I do think the Knicks will be favored in that game. Um, you know, the Kings are hurting right now, but like, look, Kings are a good team. Like they're gonna have to get a win here against a quote unquote good team, um, or take care of business against all of or for all those Bulls games. And the Nets game, and or you know, beat Boston or Milwaukee. There's a lot of ways they could do it. I'm confident they. I'm confident they will find one of those ways. But like, you know, it, it creeps into your mind. That's all. It does. It does. I'm. I've reached the point of this. The floor being Orlando, like the five seed. They'll just give me Orlando, and I'll I'll call this season a success. Um, I think the I think the six is. 
probably a little bit more on the table. Yeah. It's on the table, but I'm I'm not. What I'm saying is, as far as hopes, I've I've turned my back on the three seed. Like I'm I'm not oh, even looking eh, that direction. That's fair. You that's know, fair. the Cavs have the eighth easiest schedule left. Other than the, uh, the eighth easiest schedule, Knicks have the eighth most difficult schedule left. So, um, I I would sign up right now for uh Orlando and just have seven home games. I've been saying that for for a while. For so a we've 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 all reached your level. I know. <laughs> I just yeah. now they they're starting to lose games, and you can't realistic. Well, not I'm going to say not unrealistically look at the three or the two seed. Um, because ironically, if Man, two bounces or two shots get made against San Antonio and uh, and OKC. Like a couple bounces in either of those games, right? Those are either or games. You win both of them. That Washington win over the Bucks looks a lot different in the fourth quarter tonight because the Knicks would have sure. been playing for a tie in the fourth quarter no, for I, the two seed. I know. Which uh, look, this is what the seasons become. A lot of what ifs. It's. And the only what if that matters at this point is well, it's not a what if, but the only the only if that ma- the only what the only if the only any word that matters is uh, is whether they get the guys back that they're missing, and if they do, and they're in the four or five, and they win that, and they face Boston in the second round, then you take you feel okay, you take your chances. That's that's first with a bullet. Nothing, I mean, not nothing else matters, but like you know. That's what matters. So let's let's worry about that. Can I ask you a question about the super chats? Sure. Well, because you you kind of led the witness counselor with uh, I know I'm assuming Josh Hart's going to be the punching bag tonight, and everybody punches on Josh Hart. I don't want us to get into a fight because I love you and I don't want to fight with you. Sure. But like, what is reasonable criticism of Josh Hart allowed to be? He had a bad game. Okay. Are people allowed to be like? Hey, he was playing poorly. Maybe you should have had more offense in the floor at the end of the game. Now, I disagree with that. I would have rather people could spe- say whatever they want. That's the big, wonderful part of the democracy that we run here. I could disagree yes. with it. And then in the midst of disagreement, do they get put in that you're just joining the crowd that pounds on Josh oh, Hart? Or will look, it be like, I, oh, yeah, you're allowed to disagree with the decision. And I'm allowed to disagree with you back. And thank you for the contribution. We look, we, we, we do the same song and dance here every night, which is. They lose games and fans overreact and they say the thing that is the that is the lowest hanging fruit. That is the that is what fans do. But the vast majority of the fans are not in this for having nuanced takes and they are in this to get shit off of their chest and be frustrated and yell and scream. And I'm here to listen to them and humor them. That is my job. So that is what I will do tonight like I do every night. OK, is that what you wanted? I'm, I'm saying the quiet for- part out loud. No, no, no. I think it's obvious that fans are frustrated after games. Listening and humoring is the thing that, and maybe just one other word, understanding is the thing that I was going for. Jo- Josh Hart, here's what Josh Hart is. Josh Hart is a role player. Mm-hmm. And role players are role players because they are imperfect. And role players don't have good games every game. Otherwise, wait for it. They wouldn't be role players. Yes, John. And yes, they have flaws. And I think there is a reasonable point in time when you could come, when you could approach certain games and look at it and say, um, okay, the coach's decision to keep this particular role player in this game for this time may have contributed to the loss. Do I think if you go back and you look at all the offensive possessions, because here's the thing, they got back, they got back into this game with defense. And Josh Hart was a massive part of them getting back into this game with defense. And it, there was, uh, for as much as Josh Hart made some negative offensive possessions, uh, had some negative pos- offensive possessions throughout the game, if you go back and you watch the end of the fourth quarter, when it was nut cutting time. The things that went wrong for the Knicks had nothing to do with Josh Hart on offense. There was not a single possession that I can remember in the last five minutes of that game, certainly after they tied the game, where Josh Hart being in there, it was not like anyone was playing off of him and doubling Brunson or something like Brunson. Those were good looks or one was the good look and one was a turnover. So it was a bad possession. It happens, but no one's going to kill Brunson, right? Because it's Jalen Brunson. I mean, I hope nobody's going to kill Brunson. So it's like, what do we do? We're going to kill Josh Hart. You know, do I think that that was his his being in there at the end made it closer to them winning the game or closer to them losing, losing the game? I think it made them closer to winning the game. Um, Because, again, there's a 100 things that Josh Hart does that – you know, a lot of people just don't notice. So 
That's my take. So anybody that has that criticism of Josh Hart, not the the one that John said at the beginning during the monologue, the, which was nuanced and I thought it was fair. He needs to look for his shot more. The he does. what he just said about the winning plays, I co-signed that. I we were talking about it on the watch along. Like, do you think about sitting Hart here? And I was like, well, then that's bogey at the four. Then you're stuck with like literally no rebounding, but precious in that sense. It's and death. Yeah, I didn't agree with it, John. I, I was okay with Josh Hart being in the yeah. game at the end, even though I was a lot frustrated with a lot of his offensive possessions. Oh, was really they lost it was this game, game because Jalen Brunson had an off night and Terry Rozier had a very on night. That's it. And because Bam Adebayo is a dirty, dirty man that sets illegal screens on every possession. And I know John's not going to co-sign that, but Nick's Twitter, well, please join I'll, me. I'll, oh, I'll he is. Yeah, oh, I'll look, co-sign. we got John Macri to co-sign something against the Miami Heat. I love it. Okay. Listen. I just took that very dirty, uh, very extremely dirty. Well, well, the best is that we actually resorted to actual play by play for the last eight minutes. <laughs> and Mensa, God bless him, went to the full like Homer. So it wasn't like Bam sets a screen for Terry Rozier. It's like Bam with a dirty screen. Like always, it's 15 tonight. Like it was just going all in. If you want to re-listen or re-watch the last eight minutes with Mensa's play-by-play, it's available on our YouTube channel with the broadcast. You can listen to it on our Patreon. Um, anybody that wants to uh, go at Josh Hart, I took the beating for you, and hopefully That's John has gotten it out of his system. People, people say whatever they want. He's a frustrating player. I get he's a frustrating player. He's an easy guy to he's an easy guy to 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 come down hard on. Mm-hmm. I just you know let's let's remember that when he's winning games for us and he's won a lot of games for us. And on that note, on that note. Kevin Danishevsky, what's going on, Kev? Thanks for starting us off. Of course, it's a Rosier game. Yeah, it was going to be something. Um, why did I take three and one? I don't know what the hell I was thinking. I think, look, I, maybe I'll win. Um, only two up on Miami, though. I think I'm still not that worried with the tiebreaker. What the heck? Why the heck was Hardenstein not in there? Yeah, I, I addressed that already. Um, is it, to me, of the... Of of the any decisions that may like took place at the end of the game, <clears throat> I do wonder with Hardenstein. I think you're probably losing a little bit. You're probably taking a bit more of a risk on defense, um, just because of how Miami plays. You could he could have helped you maybe get some better shots though, so that's that's the other side of the coin, um, because I just he's been such a force on offense, you know, and I know he didn't do a ton tonight, but in general I think, and like but again like he wasn't having a great game, so I don't know I didn't have a huge issue with it I'll say that, thanks, Kev. Busy I miss Julius. I'm sure you do, uh, Busy. Yeah, they miss Julius. They miss Julius. And I hope, I hope, like, again, when, they, when they're when they winning games and it's, it's the, you know, you're, you're beating up on crappy teams and, and the shots are going down and the whole thing, it's very easy to be like, oh, you know, do we, do we really need Julius back and this and that? They need him. They need him bad, man. They need him. They, I think... I think they, again, this is another game. Like, they probably win if Julius is there. You know, not 100%, but I would like their chances. Say that about the last three games. Thanks, Busy. Dr. Harmon Parmar, what's going on? Always hurts to lose to the Heat. OG missing so many games makes you wonder if the trade was worth it, especially with the bag he will be demanding. Well, he's going to demand it, and he's going to get it. Um, I think, so, I. Actually, shout out to Steph Bondi, who put out a nice article for the Post um, earlier today. He spoke to a couple, <clears throat> I don't know if they were, someone who were, people who, some kind of doctor who knows what they're talking about with like elbow tendinopathy and, and whatnot. And it kind of, kind of calmed my fears as far as the long-term stuff. With the, like, basically, like, th- this is not a long-term thing. This seems to be something where it's the sort of thing that, if you have surgery in this area and 
you put too much strain on the muscle muscles whatever tendons tendons i think um this is the sort of thing that could pop up i don't think it makes og injury prone i mean the guy had bone spurs he had surgery this is an after effect of the surgery you know i don't think it makes him weak i don't think it makes him like injury prone necessarily um so i'm not gonna have an issue with that what i think and you know shout out to benji he's been tooting this horn for a little while now and some people came after him for it i mentioned it in the last game i'll mention it again now like the Knicks medical staff that let him back in initially uh, that's that was an interesting decision but um like was the trade worth it again to me i'm always going to be a process over results guy we saw we saw that the process was sound because of how this team has looked with OJ Anunoby on the floor. Like, there's no question the process was sound. Um, now you just got to keep your fingers crossed that, like, he's not a guy that keeps getting dinged up. And I am more than willing to have that level of faith moving forward. Thank you, Doctor. Guy Huber, then. What's going on, Guy Huber? Anyone beating their chest online about wanting to play the Heat in the playoffs is completely delusional. That is all. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Do I think that they would win a series against the Heat? I do. Um, as currently constituted, actually, maybe not. Actually, you know, not, maybe, no, not maybe not. As currently constituted, I do not think that they would win a series against the Heat. I think if they got OG back, they would win a series against the Heat. I think if they got just Julius back, I think they would probably win a series against the Heat. If they got the both back, I think they would definitely win a series against the Heat. But, like, the Heat are... Like, you know, they're going to be rounding into form now that, you know, they're playing at their best. You can, you can't, you can't kill them. Um, you know, they're at such a tough matchup, uh, for the Knicks, I think for, for different reasons. And, you know, because, and this is the, you know, this is the, th this is again, the, the genesis of why I will, I will always defend Tibbs is the Knicks are, on a night to night basis. And I think um, I got a little sneak preview of an article that uh, Fred Katz is going to be dropping pretty soon in which um, I'll just say that some enlightening quotes on Tom Thibodeau from uh, at least one member of the current team. Um, like on a night to night basis, they are as prepared as well prepared as any team in the league. The one guy who would have an argument with that and who is a part of that discussion and probably first in that discussion over Tibbs is Spo. So when the Knicks play the Heat, all of the advantages that they get against pretty much every other team from a we are more prepared to than you to win the game tonight, they don't have that same advantage against the Heat. Now, was that why they lost tonight? No, I think they lost tonight because Terry Rozier went crazy and Jalen Brunson had it off night. And for all the stuff I talked about earlier, which is like, I just think they're kind of worn down. But I do think that that would play a role, you know, if the two teams played again in the playoffs. So we'll see. Thanks, Q Hoover. As the Cavs are now up by 18, as the third quarter draws to a close. Dean, what's going on, Dean? Great to hear from you, man. Most hated team. Excuse the language. Fuck the heat. No, man, you could fuck everything about Miami. Just I really be careful. don't like the team. Just be careful, Dean. I know you're from across the pond. Well, I guess that's not the pond. What is the West Coast? Across the water, okay? Um, be careful when you're fuck everything about Miami because it's Miami. Like They got a reputation down in Miami. So just be be very careful. I just, for the, we got unified healing on on, to, on deck if, if necessary. Just be very oh, careful. Okay. Yeah, okay. Next up. No, fuck the heat. It's out of respect, too. Um, you Huber with another one at the end, you take heart out who's giving you nothing and it is an offensive detriment and finish with Devo and bogey. Yeah, we talked about it already. I disagree. It's death on defense. It's death on the boards. Um, and I think you were getting enough because like you need, you need two spacers around Brunson. And I think the Knicks were moving well enough on offense. And for the most part, you know, 
a, a, a couple of maybe forced looks from Brunson notwithstanding, um, I think they were moving well enough on offense that having the two floor spacers out there was enough with with Josh Hart and with Precious um, or whoever the center was. I don't think you need a fourth floor sp- or a third floor spacer, spacer, I guess, ostensibly, you know, and um, again, it's just like kind of a diminishment of everything else that he does. So, you know, we'll, we'll agree to disagree there, Goober. Thanks for the contribution, though. Dom, what's going on, Dom? Three-game winning streak to three-game losing streak. It's exactly, exactly what happened last year for what it is worth. They had a three-game winning streak. I'm going to go right now to it, actually. So, last season, the Knicks won. They lost. They, They had the great stretch. Then they lost three in a row. Then they won three in a row. And then they lost three more in a row. Here, it wasn't three losses in a row. It was the Denver loss. Then they won three in a row, and now they've lost three in a row. We'll see what they can put together <clears throat> from here. Um, the sixth seed, all of a sudden, not out of the question. Dangerous times, my friend. Dangerous times, all I got tonight. No, I mean, but again, here's the nice thing about the East. And I, I mean this. I genuinely mean this. For as much as it would feel disappointed to me, the, here's the thing. For me, the mo- the t- what I perceive would be the toughest part about falling to six is that they would have fallen to six. The, f- the feeling like we hung tight for so long. We hung tight and we hung tight and we hung tight and then we hung tight some more. And at the very end, we couldn't hang tight for long enough and we fell down to sixth. The mental, the mental part of that is what I would worry about the most. And yet, as I say that, I fully believe that this is the most mentally tough team in the entire league. I believe that with all of my heart. And if that is true, and they are the most mentally tough team in the entire NBA, then you better believe that they will be ready and they will not be feeling sorry about themselves that they have to go into Cleveland, or I guess theoretically Orlando could still make a run, but probably Cleveland on game one of the playoffs because they're going to be like, hey, we beat this fucking team last year. We're going to beat them again, even though we may not have all of our guys. And then, oh, by the way, if you do pull that off, then you avoid Boston in the second round and you face this Milwaukee team that is capable of losing to the Washington Wizards. So, like. I think there would be a silver lining there. All that being said, do I want to be in the four or five matchup? Absolutely. And I've said this to you, Dom, privately, and I've said this to, to in town halls. I've said this on, I probably have said this on here. I think for this Knicks team, they absolutely need to get out of the first round this year to just f- to, to, to feel like that they, they're keeping the momentum moving forward as an organization. And they don't feel the need to ask any, dicey, uncomfortable questions in the offseason. I like where this thing is going. I like what they have going on. I like the culture. I like all of that. I want to keep all that together. And I fear that if they somehow lost in the first round, that I, I, w- I would just be worried. I would just be worried about that part of it staying staying together. And I do think if they fall to six, it makes it more likely they lose in the first round than if they stayed in the four or five. That's just my two. Now, and then the last thing I'll say on top of all that, maybe it's going to be be careful what you wish for. Maybe you go in the four or five and it's Cleveland as opposed to Orlando. Maybe Orlando moves up to the three. Like all of this shit is on the table at this point, which is why to sit here and talk about it right now is kind of a waste of time. And it's just like, just win games, you know, win games, let the chips fall where they may. And again, hope you get your guys back. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate you as always. Sam Garcia's dad. What's going on, um, Ray? We overachieved when outman, and now we're coming back to the mean. But hey, a bogey sighting. Get me to the playoffs and get me my guys back from the injured reserve. Yes, that's where I'm at. I think that's where we should all be at. Um, Again, like, this team is not falling apart under the pressure. They are playing... They are playing to the level that they probably should be playing over the long haul, you know, with that, with, with, 
with two massive components of their team missing. Um, so hopefully they get back. That's all you could say. Hopefully they get back. Anthony six though. What's going on, Anthony? Hart is not going to be a big offensive threat, but when he's not even looking to shoot, it makes life harder. It makes life immeasurably harder. And it makes life harder just by the fact that he's like he's a- by actively not being a threat to shoot, he that takes away something that the defense has to worry about. That's demerit number one. Demerit number two is, and again, I forget who tweeted it out. The New York basketball account retweeted it. The Heat were able to overplay the passing lanes because they didn't have to worry about him shooting. So then it turns into turnovers, which lead to Heat points, which that's arguably an even bigger crime. So completely agree there. If they staggered the bogey minutes to get him more JB time, does that, can that continue to settle him in? So I'm just I'm I'm trying to play this out in my head. So I think he looked pretty settled in tonight. Let me start with that, right? I think he looked pretty settled in. I think he looked good. Maybe this is what turns it around. Um I'm I'm just like, you know, they should always be thinking about different ways to use these guys to the fullest of their abilities. Um I I I'm gathering what you're saying is maybe a little bit more bogey with Brunson as opposed to Har with Brunson. The problem there is how are you making that up on the defensive end? So who are your next best defenders? On the perimeter, <clears throat> it's Deuce and it's Steven Chenzo. And all of a sudden you see where like you can see where this is going. You can see where it's going because it's like that replacing Hart with Bogey on defense I think it re- I think you really I think you feel that. And I don't know if the trade off I just don't know if the trade off is worth it. Um maybe it is. I don't know, which is why like but Bogey in place of DiVincenzo, you still get hard out there. At least Bogey gives you a little bit more size. Obviously DiVincenzo is a better defender than him. But like these are tough decisions. These are tough decisions, and they're and they're tough decisions that are forced by the fact that they are limited, and that you don't have OJ Ananobi there, who is kind of this cure all for you know so many other situations where it's like, oh, it's okay if we have Deuce and OG out there together. Well, then we could we could live with Brunson and Bogey if we have like one of the centers. Like Hart is not at OG's level. On defense, but at the same time, he is so important for where they are right now with the personnel that they have available to them. It's it's a really tough, it's a really tough set of considerations, you know. But I, you're you know, you're not wrong for wanting to see more of him with Brunson. That's absolutely. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Robert W. Cross. Hello, Robert. First time, long time, Richard Boy John. Could we have a '90s throwback night and someone in orange and blue, flat out, takes out Bam? I am here for it. And the dude's gonna go to the Hall of Fame too. I trust you will not be at the induction induction ceremony, Robert. Um, Bam is he's a really good player. He's a dirty player. He's a frustrating player when you have to play against him. Actually, I wonder something that I I don't know as well as I should. And I'm curious and Andrew maybe could shed some light on this now or later in the podcast. I wonder what the, what the, what the approval rating is on BAM amongst T fans, because I go ahead, go ahead, get in here. Finish. No, I was going to say I could see it being not universal approval because he can be a frustrating offensive player at times. You know, the Twitter war that myself and now the casuals have engaged in with, the heat Twitter that that I alluded to at the beginning of the show. Sure, uh, it's over Bam Adebayo. Uh, Bam Adebayo, Idris, as his mama called him. Idris, yeah. Um, uh, he had that little step out and he dirty play against uh, Jalen Brunson at one point, and yes. uh, Teg from uh, 
a tag from IQ for three, clipped it, and I just was. Uh, I, that's been the the story, and they're defending their guy over there, and it, it's okay. a bit of a war that way. So for whatever Twitter's worth, it seems to be like stop complaining. We grew up in the '90s where it was more physical, and okay. we went from just, Charles Oakley to you're now you're bitching about Bam out of bio, and I would respond by, by saying that. Um, but I, I admire fight and physical play. What I don't admire is being afraid for the health and safety of my players to survive a heat game. I, I only ask because like, he's a similar player to Anthony Davis. He's not as good as Anthony Davis, which is more to my point, which is that Anthony Davis will have these games where he'll, you know, whatever, 12 points on like, you know, eight shots or something. And he'll get absolutely fucking murdered because people are like, how is Anthony Davis not doing more? Like Bam has a lot of those games too, where he's just like not that impactful offensively, at least from a scoring standpoint. Like he's not a dangerous offensive weapon. Sometimes, sometimes he really is. But that you know, I, I'm I wonder if, yeah, I don't know. That's that's all. I was. Yeah, you answer my I, question. I the, the universal approval. There are some Heat fans I know that don't call him Bam, call him Adris for the games that you mentioned. Uh, okay, like only on games that you're good, we call you Bam, but. Okay. That's I think fine. he's won entirely too much with the Heat tonight to have an appreciation for him. I mean, he should go down. He's going to go down with Zoe. Yeah. You know, like he's second, in that. Third be- second or third best center in Heat history. Depends how you how you classify Chris Bosh. Do you take the Shaq two years there? Uh, yeah. I mean, look, they've had, they're they lucky. They've had a lot of great players. So. Yeah. yeah. yeah but he's, a, he's, a, he's an institution. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Um, Ernst D, what's going on, Ernst? Annoying loss, but this team never stops fighting. No, they don't. No, they don't. Say what you want about them. Say what you want about anybody on the team. Like they, they, they just fight. They just don't give in. They don't give in. Uh, probably my favorite Nick team since the '99 playoff run, even considering 2013. Um, I mean, to me, it's is it this year or last year, and personally. Personally, I like this team better. I like this team better because I have, and this is the part that's like, maybe will sound a little strange because I know it's been an incredibly frustrating two plus months with these guys not in the lineup. I have adored, adored seeing Brunson with the two Nova guys get the amount of time together that they have and more often than not, I know it doesn't feel like it tonight, but more often than not, impact winning on to a significant degree and just playing basketball the way that basketball is supposed to be played. And then you throw in Isaiah Hardenstein, and then you throw in Deuce McBride, um, and then you throw in the, the nice surprise that has been Pressure Sachua. Like, that, like, it's been, for a ragtag group of guys that are missing some heavy hitters, like, they have really endeared themselves to me at least. And that's not even mentioning the version of the team that was whatever they were 14 and two in the month of January, which is pretty freaking awesome too. Um, so for me, I, th- this is, this is my number one since 99. So yeah, thanks. Ernst. That's, I needed a little, little positive comment there. Alex, other Alex, the very slow starts to games are becoming a problem. I hope the sp- staff spends these next few days doing a deep dive on why this continues happening. Um, I so offensively, they came out slow against the Thunder. I think the issue was defensively they came out without the proper level of engagement against the Spurs. Prior to that, like I, I what is I don't I always forget this phrase. Like once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is a trend. Some, does that sound right? Yeah, let's go with that. Okay, so we're at three times where they came out and the offense maybe, but again the San Antonio I thought their offense was okay coming out of the gate. I'll go back and look it up and see what uh, they actually scored in the first quarter of that San Antonio game. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my my recollection eludes me. I mean, they scored 27 points in the first half against or the first quarter against San Antonio. Um, their defense gave up 38 points. So 
that was more of the problem. And the actually the other the bigger issue was, yeah, they had they had twenty three with three oh eight left to go in the first quarter against the Spurs, and then they kind of um, sputtered in the last uh, several minutes after Brunson left the game. So I, they they really offensively they came out fine against San Antonio. We're talking about two games. And one of the two games that we're talking about was against a uh, top five defense from Oklahoma City two days ago. And tonight was really where they came out and was like they were just off. I thought the looks were pretty good. thought they just they were missing threes that were pretty good threes. I think it's, this is so this feels like a little bit of an overreaction to me. But, um, you know, if you want to say it's something to watch moving forward, that's fine. Kevin with another one. Hart needs to be better than that. Yeah. The zero disagreement. Um, he's been key of late, so can't complain. No, you can complain. I'm complaining. I, if Hart has a typical Josh Hart game, I think the Knicks win this. You know, I think they. I think if Hart has a typical Josh Hart game, they overcome Brunson's poor performance, presuming they also get what they got from Bogey, DiVincenzo, and obviously McBride. So absolutely complain. Um, he can't have games like this. On the other hand, good job, Bogey and Deuce. Yeah. And DiVincenzo, man, come on, let's give DiVincenzo his props. Dude, that dude, sub again, needs to be said. We we love Towton McBride's contract. DiVincenzo, I still think, arguably, is the better bargain. Sub, full, non-taxpayer, mid-level money, gets you 30 points like nothing. Dude's averaging 20. Still, I think he's averaging 20 points a game since the injuries. Insanity on, on the efficiency and the amount of threes he's putting up. Thanks, Kev. Tingus Pingus. I think this was, he had uh, one of our uh, Super Chat of the Year. Uh, uh, am, am I, should I prepare myself for what lies in store? Uh, if Randall's out for the season, we won't know the ceiling of this team without seeing how they fall short. How can the Knicks plan? The offseason is OG worth a max with his injuries. So, a couple things. The OG and an OB max, for anybody wondering, <clears throat> is um, 30% of the salary cap. That is uh, more than $200 million. I forget what the exact number is. I did I did the math. I believe the cap next year, Andrew, double check me on this because I'm it's late. Um, I think the cap next year is going to be 141. So uh, 30% of that, yeah, is $42.3 million. And uh, $42.3 million, that's, that would be a year one salary. And then you can get 8% raises from there. So uh, just doing some quick math, uh, that if, again, if, if we're talking a full five-year max for Ananobi, uh, we would be in year five of that max. He bet fifty seven point five million dollars. I think in total, I think that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of like two thirty. I think it's his five year max. He's not getting that. I'm going to tell you right now, he's not getting a five full full five year max. I think the more interesting question, <clears throat> and I'm going to get back to the first part of your question in a sec. I think the more interesting question is whether there is a team out there that would offer him the max that they could offer him, which is four years starting at 30% of the cap, but with only 5% raises. And that would top out at um, uh, something in the neighborhood of like 180 for four years, maybe a little bit more than 180 for four years. Now, four years, $180 million worth of OJ and Anobi, you might be like, that's insane. If some team out there wants to throw that much money at him, have fun. Well, here's the problem. He is getting at least $35 million a year. At least. Even with this injury situation, he's getting at least $35 million a year because Jeremy Grant, and Fred talked about this on our, on our pod, correctly mentioned Jeremy Grant's getting 32 a year. So OG Ananobi and his agent, who granted has some ties with the Knicks, are going to take one look at Jeremy Grant and be like, that dude's getting 32 a year. Well, my we're, we're like, you can't pay me less than that. And they shouldn't pay him less than that because he's worth more than that. He's that important. So let's just say 
there is a world where it's the 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 annual av- the average annual salary is 35 a year. Okay, fine. 35 times four. Let's say you get him at four years, four fully guaranteed years. Maybe they do some kind of option thing with the last year. You're at 140. You're at four for 140. I don't think you're getting him at 35 flat for four years or something that averages 35. I think if anything, that might be your starting salary. <clears throat> so to me, a a re, a more realistic baseline is four for 150. That's me. Maybe they, maybe they could finagle something less. Um, you know, whatever. Somewhere in that range. Let's say. Let's just say, for argument's sake, that is what he like, quote unquote, should get in this this NBA economy. Well, if the max is four for one eighty or four for one eighty two, that another team could give him. Put yourself in that other team's war room for a second this summer. And they're like, all right, we're paying this guy over the course of four years, maybe an average of $8 million a year more than he's quote unquote worth. Well, what is that $8 million a year? That $8 million a year is the tax that you have to pay to get a guy an unrestricted free agency when nobody, and I mean nobody, of this caliber leaves teams an unrestricted free agency anymore. It does not happen. Maybe Paul George will be the first player in quite some time to break that rule. Guess what? Paul George is 34, 35 years old. And if someone Philly knock, knock wants to give him $200 million to play basketball until he's 38, 39 years old. I mean, more power to him, but like, so I guess my 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 this is my very long-winded way of saying I don't think it's that insane in the slightest to think that another team would quote unquote overpay. And again, I'm not entirely convinced it's an overpay, but let's just say for argument's sake it's an overpay, OJ and Anobi, because what is the overpay? The overpay is the right to get him in a method that you would not otherwise be able to get him with. Because the, the normal method to get these sorts of players is to trade for them, which is what the Knicks did which is why they had to give up Emmanuel quickly into a lesser extent RJ Barrett. So like it's like, to, to, that's why to me, it's like, it, it's, I, I would not be shocked in the least if some team was willing to make that sort of commitment. So then you turn back to the Knicks and at the end of the day, like, yeah, OG may, uh, he may love playing in New York. He lo- may love, you know, the, the CAA tie and the whole thing. Dude's still going to want to get paid. And if there's another offer out there, that's better than what the Knicks could put out there. I, would imagine that he would at the very least seriously entertain it. So this is a very long winded way of saying, I do not think the Knicks are going to have a lot of wiggle room this summer. I think that they are going to have to open up the checkbook. Now, what does the checkbook look like? I would, I would guess that it would wind up being something in the neighborhood of if it's five years, Maybe there's some like a partial guarantee on the fifth year. Maybe it's actually a team option, but like with bigger money. But again, something around the average of like 36, 37, uh, you know, million dollars a year. Which, again, it sounds like a ton of money. Go look at the average NBA or go look at the NBA salaries for next season and the season after that and the season after that. Like we're getting to a place where you are going to see. $70 $70 million players in the not too distant future. So um, I think we have to kind of recalibrate what we think of as far as the Randall part of it. Um, how could they plan the off season? You know, I don't think that's going to, I think their off season will be dictated to them by who does and does not become available. And if there is someone that becomes available, that is worth going out and getting and doing what you have to do to go out and get, they will go out and get that player. If not, they will, you know, make the best decision available to them. Might it become slightly more difficult if there's like a, a sub superstar player that becomes available and they have to actually really sit there and hem and haw about like, is, are we better off with Randall? Are we better off with this player? Yeah. But like, honestly, They'd probably be having those conversations anyway. So I don't know. Thanks, things, Pingus. That was actually a good, good, good uh super chat there. 
Robert W. Cross. It's your boy, John. Consensus is still underrating Deuce McBride. I'm not anymore. So don't group me in with consensus. Best story since February. He's only going to get better. Yeah, I mean, at this fucking point, I mean, really, um, what, what, what more can you say? What more can you say about a guy that, um, again, I included the stat um, in today's newsletter. <clears throat> Deuce McBride is playing more minutes per game over a seven-game stretch than any player in the league since, I believe, 2016 or something like that. Um, and his minute average over now it's going to be the last eight games went up. The thing that is very very cool and what is i think wholly unexpected at least from again as i said at the top of the show <clears throat> from my perspective is the the offensive output and now you look at it and over the last it is the last eight games man I, i'm seeing this and i don't believe it over the last eight games deuce pride is averaging 19.8 points per game on 40, or excuse me, 51% shooting overall, 64% shooting from deep on 8.63 uh, attempts per game from deep and 94% from the line on 2.1 free throw attempts per game. The assists are still low, a little lower than you'd like. 3.4 assists in 45 minutes essentially per game is, is not a lot for a, even a combo guard. It's not a lot. So that's got to get a little bit better. But I mean, he's 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 20 points a game on 50, 40, 90. I mean, I know it's an eight game sample size, but I wouldn't have thought that Deuce McBride was a guy who could be a 50, 40, 90 player with 20 points a game on a two game sample size. Let alone an eight game sample size. And that's where we're at right now. It's great stuff from Deuce. Thanks, Robert. Kevin uh, with another one. <laughs> John is right. Card is, was great on D. I take it back. You know what would be awesome? I wish you were trolling me here. I know, know you're not because you're an awesome guy, Kev. It would be actually funnier if you were trolling me. Um, look, I don't know if I'm right. I'm I'm impassioned when it comes to certain things. And uh, unsurprisingly to anybody who has ever watched me once, uh, I am impassioned about uh, Josh Hart. And because I think he just plays the game the right way. And um, I wish I wish that I had a team full of guys, maybe not full of guys like Josh Hart, need, needed Jalen Brunson in there. But I love Josh Hart. and I love how he plays and I love how hard he plays. I love that he gives everything he has. Thanks, Kev. Jessica, what's going on, Jessica? Uh, it's good to it's good to hear from you. Um, I feel like it's been a little while. The armchair medical experts who are blaming our injured players for losses, telling them to play through it with little or no info on the extent of the injuries can shut the fuck up. It's foolish and ignorant. I'm here for the verbiage, Jessica. Um, I just like, no, I, look again. This is the, this is the theme of like, it's the theme of every loss. It's the theme, you know, to a certain extent of the last two months. <clears throat> The unknown is a dangerous thing. And I don't know who the first person was to say this, but someone a hell of a lot wiser than me a long time ago was the first person to utter that we fear what we do not know. And that plays itself out in much more serious, uh, you know, ways in society. Um, but it also plays itself out in something like this. And like people, when they don't know something when they don't understand something when they don't have all the facts they often in this situation i think probably fear is maybe the wrong emotion but like they think the worst because they don't know and i i get that i totally get that especially when you do have some reporting on the subject with og again in the past in the past there have been people around the toronto raptors who were like he is a guy who doesn't always play if he's not feeling up to his best. But even that reporting, and I, I don't want to put reporting in air quotes because I, I that that 
disrespects the people who do a very difficult profession and do it very well, but like they are reporting on the opinions of some people. They are not reporting on a fact. Nobody can nobody can report on a fact that OJ Ananobi like could be playing, you know, or or has a it's feeling a, a, the way that like if 95% of other players are feeling that way, they would play. Like no one can report on that because we don't again, we don't know. It is the unknown. So I'm always leery of going down that road. Um, and I, I appreciate the sentiment here for, for that reason. Thank you, Jessica. Cavs lost, or excuse me, Cavs won, by the way. Cavs won. Buzzer beater. Giovanni Mistretta. She is on one. Hashtag go Knicks. Um, Giovanni Mistretta. Giovanni Mistretta. Andrew, help me out. I don't know. Am I missing someone who's blowing up like the woman's final four or something? Giovanni Mistretta is a common super chatter. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I have no idea what this is in reference to. I see Giovanni in the chat. He's talking about Jessica. Oh, she's on one. He's pointing up at the super chat that you just read from Jessica. Oh, okay. Yes. She's on one. There we go. So there you go. Alex, other Alex. With him under contract through 25, what does Tibbs have to do in the playoffs? to have Leon entertain talks of his desired extension in the off season. Um, what does he have to do in the playoffs? I don't, I don't know that he has to do anything. I mean, he deserves a contract extension. He's like, eh, look, the Knicks are a funny organization or they have been a funny organization historically. And it's not just under Dolan. It's like Dolan gets a bad rap. They've done a lot of silly, overreactive shit really throughout the course of their history. Um, other than a select few times when they've had stability and they've won. <clears throat> I'm not going to sit here and say Tom Thibodeau should be the coach of the Knicks for as long as he wants to be because like every coach reaches an expiration date, right? Um. The fact that you have a coach who is, again, this is not me saying this. This has been re reported on. I can't, I don't know how many different times, in how many different ways, from how many different players. It's just the, the consensus, not that he's a nice, cuddly guy, not that players love playing for him. It is purely that. If you want to win games, he will have you better prepared to win a basketball game than basically any coach out there. And if like what, as I've said many times, what else are we doing here? If that is not the goal, if the players are still responding to him now, you're telling me like he gets involved in a series and like, he's so badly ex -co out coached from like, in X's and O's standpoint or like anything like that. Like, all right, I guess I can see a world where it's like, they, they're like, you know what? It's ever going to happen. I just, I don't, I don't see that. Cause that's never happened. It's never happened before. And with all due respect to the fact that yes, he started Josh Hart in the playoffs last year. And that impacted the Knicks in some negative ways. I, I will, I will die on this Hill. Like, the, the guy that we were all clamoring for, some of us were clamoring for, maybe not me as much as others, was Quentin Grimes and go look at what Quentin Grimes shot in the playoffs last year. And, like, and you know, and Josh Hart didn't play as well as he needed to play to make that decision really pay off. But, like, that's not, that's not like getting badly outcoached. That's just, like, you made a judgment call. It kind of maybe didn't work out as well as we would have liked. And it was an easy target for people afterwards. Um, but that dude's like. So my answer is like, I guess nothing. He doesn't need to do anything. He just needs to keep doing what he's doing. Thanks, Alex. Gun to your head. Did they extend him? Yeah. Even if they lost in the first round. Like. How, how long an extension? Oh, or do you know. think that might be up to Tibbs? 
No, I mean, like, it. I mean, really want to get into like. Here's the thing, because he is a prickly sort, and I don't know what or- organization is going to hand the reins to a guy like Tibbs who comes with bag. Like, there's no question he comes with baggage. And mm. part of the reason this is working is he has his friends running the organization, you know, and they are able. And Leon Rose, what is Leon Rose great at? Leon Rose is a great manager of people. He's a great communicator. He is a great galvanizer. He is a he is a people person. He can he can he can make it work. Right. He can make the, the collection of people work. That it shit ain't happening if Tibbs goes to whatever other team. So I don't know that Tibbs negotiating position even in the light of Monty Williams and Pop and Spo and 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 Kerr getting paid what they're getting paid, I don't know if Tibbs is gonna be like, yeah, I, you know, five years, fifty million, or I walk. Like he can't fucking do that. He's gonna, you know, I'm sure they'll pay him fairly, but I don't. I don't. I also like how much longer does he want to coach? All fair. Yeah. For what it's I, worth, the answer I was hoping for was like one, two years, like at how least long two. An extension. Yeah. Two years on top of this one. Person, I think they probably give him three, if I had to guess. I would think they go two. Like Maybe. Because then you have 25. It's technically three years left, and then you reassess. But to your point about CAA taking care of CAA, or specifically his friends, maybe they offer him three. Yeah. yeah we'll see. I mean, I'm not I'm not really worried about that part. But, I, yeah, I think he'll be back. Um. Varunsky's take. Oh man, it's been a while. I feel like we haven't had Varunsky's take on here uh, in a bit, but um, I remember you from from last season. Uh, is there any part of you that feels that Bogey would have become a fabric of this team's offense and a positive contributor, like you projected him to? Bend has. Um, has he forgotten how to be good, or is it? fair and reasonable to say that he can get in rhythm in 15 is it unfair to say that he could get in rhythm in 15 minutes um <clears throat> i think that basically the gist of this is like do i think bogey would be better if he had gotten more minutes breen mentioned it tonight on the broadcast he's a guy that's always started he's a guy that's played an average of 30 minutes that was just never going to happen here um and do i think that they should have played him a lot more I oh man, I would have to go back and look at some of those. I'll, I mean, I'll go back and look at them now. Some of the early minute totals, because I feel like they they ran him out there for a goodly amount. I mean, he's averaging twenty minutes a game for the Knicks since he got here, um, which is that's not nothing. When he first got here, here are his minute totals: thirty-two minutes, twenty-three minutes, twenty-three. Um, 18, and that was in the Boston game where, he, like, he just couldn't survive defensively. Um, 22, 29, 18, 30, 30. Um, and then it starts to go down. 11 minutes against Orlando, but that was a game they won by a billion points, and they didn't, quote-unquote, really need him. Then 18, 22, 13, 24. So then it starts to go down. Um I don't know. I'm like looking at the plus minuses early on. Minus 14, minus 9, minus 9, minus even, minus 8, minus 10, minus 4. I'm not skipping anything, guys. Minus 12, minus 4. It's only when they started playing in reduced minutes that you started to see some plus numbers in the plus minus. Which, like, again, individual game plus minus doesn't mean really anything. Over a sample size of, like, 10 games, I think it means more so... I don't know. I, is there a part of me that thinks that he would be better if he was playing more minutes? Absolutely. Do I think it's, it'd be worth it? I'm not sure about that. But I'm, I, I also don't think it's crazy to suggest it. Will Oliver, what's going on, Will? Uh, emotions be damned. We'll be okay. On to the next one. I'm here for that. I'm here for that energy. G- it's Giovanni. What's going on, Giovanni? I'm going positive after three brutal losses. I like it. Three, four, five, or six seed, we're here. We fight every game. We've been down two of our best players most of the way. Let's fucking go, Knicks. 
I'm going to also end on a positive, and I'm going to, speaking of Tibbs, because it always comes back to Tibbs, how could it not? The team, the, the team that this team reminds me of is, and I'm going to, I'm going to get the, um, the year wrong. So I'm going to look it up so I don't sound like an idiot, although I'm sure that Andrew uh, remembers off the top of his head. Yeah, it's the 2012-13 Bulls team. The 2012-13 Bulls team that faced the Brooklyn Nets in the first round, the Brooklyn Nets of uh, Kevin Garnett and, uh, or excuse me, no, that wasn't the KG team. That was Deron Williams, Brooke Lopez, Joe Johnson, Gerald Wallace. So still like a team that a lot was expected of them. And the Bulls were, let's see who they had. I'm looking at who they had in the playoff series. So Carlos Boozer led that team in minutes in the first round. Followed by Nate Robinson. Yep. Marco Bellinelli. Um, no, sorry. Minutes. Boozer, Jimmy Butler, Luol Dang. Only played five games, though, Luol Dang. Then yeah, Noah. Game Luol, Luol Dang got, that's the series Luol Dang got hospitalized yes. for six and seven. And then Nate Robinson, Kirk Heinrich, Mark Bellinelli, Taj, and Nas Muhammad. So, yeah, they were. They were the five seed. They upset the Nets, and then they um, were, I believe, tied after four games with... No, sorry. They were the series of Miami. They won game one, got killed game two, lost a close game three, got beat pretty badly in game four, and then lost a very close game five. This team reminds me maybe of that team, if they don't get their guys back. Um, I thought Fred and from our group chat that nobody is a part of. So why am I referencing it? Um, uh, he made the comp to the next year team that had joke that joke. Kim Noah finished fourth in MVP. Um, they were a four seed that lost to the Wizards, Wizards. in in five games. Uh, that's I mean it's one of those two teams that this reminds me of. You know, yeah, that's the one series. That you could say that Tibbs in the postseason, like the result was not as it maybe should have been. Um, but I think he just kind of ran out of ran out of magic uh, with a team that was just again, it was like they ran their offense through Joakim Noah. Yeah, uh, they made the playoffs, so I'm not sure you can you can fully look. I'm not. I'm getting into a Tibbs like how high is his ceiling conversation, but I think the the talent discrepancy. Like specifically that that Brooklyn series was always the one that I pointed to as like that's that's Tibbs's accomplishment right there. That and the Cavs series last year are the two series you point to was like, oh, he knows how to how to win despite having a talent discrepancy. You know who their leading scorer was in that series that they lost in five games to the Wizards? Who? Taj. So it was okay, I was gonna say he's a Jimmy Butler. Taj averaged eighteen points a game. Um didn't start, played 31 minutes a game off the bench, led the team in scoring. Second on the team in scoring was Jimmy Butler at 13.6 points a game. Jimmy Butler was their second leading scorer. Shot, uh, we don't remember this series. Um, well, this was not playoff Jimmy's be best performance. 38% from the field, 30% from three. Um, and uh, just was did not have a his usual level of impact. Yeah. I remember and then the, the Brooklyn series really well, actually. Yeah, and then Mike Dunleavy and DJ Augustine were their third and fourth leading scorers. That's it. So names from the past, John Macri. But like again, that's this Nick team is better than that. Mm -hmm. Bulls team. I right, listen. And, give me Orlando. Give me a second round where maybe OG gets back. Then you know maybe Julius plays a game or two just to help the bench unit. Give me a chance against this this soft ass sixty five win Celtic team. You know, well, I, we got I, bully ball, bully ball coming in to play the finesse of the Celtics. Yeah. Just give me, give me second round New York, Boston. I'll take it. I'd love, to, I'd love, I'd love to see. It. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. I think everybody would like to see that at this point. Um, but we got to get there first. So, some more work to be done. All right. Uh, thanks everybody. It was good. Uh, good show. Not nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Honestly, uh, if you uh, dig what we do here, uh, support us in any way you can. You could like this video. You could subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can uh, sign up with our Patreon. Uh, still time to um, sign up for our Monroe tier. 
to be part of our town hall, which we are doing tomorrow, which I'm sure will be an interesting town hall. Um, and do, 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 what am I forgetting? Oh, yeah. And if you listen on the pod, um, so another very nice review today in the, the email that I get from uh, Chartable. Uh, so keep keep the reviews coming in. Five star ratings are good, too. And uh, we will be back with um, more fun and games later this week where we end with a back to back. Three games in four days, man. Life comes at you fast, but we'll be here for all of it. Um, thanks, Andrew. Thanks to all of you, and we will talk to you soon.